like everyone to open your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 20, beginning at verse 35. I believe that there should be no boring preaching. Somebody help me with that. There ought to be an 11th commandment that says thou shalt not bore. In the world that we live in today, there's no shortage of people with opinions. Social media made sure of that. So a lot of people gargle with gunpowder and then shoot their mouths off and they don't know what they're talking about. How many of you want the truth today? The phrase that is going to stick in you is a phrase that goes like this. The arrow is beyond you. The arrow is beyond you. It is worth waiting for. But as I said, I don't believe in boring preaching. One day there was a preacher who was so boring. It's kind of like an IQ test. Okay. One day there was, and some of you got it. I'm sorry. I'm gonna, he's the God of the second chance. Uh, there was a preacher who was so boring he was so boring that a man in the back got mad, went into the churchyard, got a brick to throw it at him. So he came back in and he threw the brick, but it didn't make it to the pulpit. It hit a man on the back of his head standing on the front row. And that man said, hit me again, I can still hear him. When you talk to an audience today in America, you need to have something to say. And you got to make sure that you are taking into account people's time. If it takes you a long time, the Bible says, where the axe is sharp, not much force is needed. And I believe a lot of preachers work the audience up for the simple reason that their points are not that important. But how do you know that what I'm going to tell you is important as a mom, a husband, a businessman, a college student, a new convert? In the world we live in, one thing is for sure, everything is changing faster than we know. Now we got a thing called artificial intelligence. They said it's this new thing called artificial intelligence. And I said we had that in Washington for years. Now, I worked on that a long time. I may be having fun so far. The difference between a good friend and a best friend is that a good friend will bail you out of jail at 3 o'clock in the morning. But a best friend is sitting next to you in the cell saying, wasn't that fun? How many of you have best friends? Raise your hand. But one day, David's best friend, Jonathan, almost got him killed. This is a hard thing to say, but I'm going to tell you. The devil's attacking your future. He's attacking your belief in the future. You hear reports all the time, everybody moving out of California. Well, God was in a good mood when he made the beach at San Diego. I don't know what he was thinking when he made Nebraska. I'm working over here. I tried that joke last night. It worked, so I tried it again. Now you can retire it, Mario. Jonathan believed that everything was cool. Everything's great. My dad, the king Saul, loves you. And David told him one day, no, he's trying to kill me. Jonathan said, don't you know, listen, this is what a best friend will get you killed. Don't you know that if you were in danger, I would know it? 
And the answer to that is a resounding, no, you wouldn't. Because you're so close to the situation. You're so close to the situation that you can't begin to understand the danger. And you see, the shocking thing was how fast all the churches in America closed down when the government told them to. Because a bunch of close friends sat together and saying, what should we do? So they went horizontal instead of going vertical and talking to God and saying, what are we supposed to do? Your best friends will kill you. How many of you have relatives? Seeing if anyone was cloned. Well, let me tell you something. Your relatives will kill you. Because they will give you a nickname. You could win the Heisman Trophy. You could win the Nobel Prize. And you go home to your relatives and they say, we don't care who you are. You will always be Bubba to us. I'm working up here. So David said, I'll prove it to you that the king wants to kill me. You tell him when I don't show up for dinner because I'm bivouacked out in the woods. Tell him that I've gone to Bethlehem to take care of family business. That was the night the king was going to assassinate him. David wasn't there. Jonathan, totally with blinders on, didn't see what was going on. And the Bible tells us that he nonchalant said to his dad when Saul said, where is David? He said, well, he had family business in Bethlehem. Now we rewind the tape to a private conversation that two best friends have. And he said, I'm going to prove it to you. And so Jonathan came up with the idea. You stay in the woods, I'll come back tomorrow, and I'll bring a young man who fetches the arrows that I, when I do archery. And I'm going to shoot an arrow. And if I say to that young man, because I fired the arrow short, if I say, come this way, the arrow is in front of you, then you'll know everything's safe at home. But if I shoot the arrow beyond you, then you will know that the Lord has sent you away. So the day came. Where's David? Family business. In that instant, Saul took a spear and threw it through the chair where David would have been sitting. And Jonathan knew that he was foolishly and unwittingly an instrument in the potential death of his best friend. Now, I'm going to tell you, San Diego VO, you're going to understand this. The arrow is beyond you. A lot of people in this town want a normal church. A lot of people want a predictable church. A lot of people want a non-offensive church. But the arrow is now beyond that. I'm going to try it again. It's beyond it. We can't have normal church. We are now at the point where only straight, honest, Bible-based preaching will make the devil flee. Now, I need some help right here. You know, our glitzy entertainment makes us feel good because we're best friends. Among friends, we think it's cool. But the devil doesn't respect it. The devil doesn't retreat before glitz and glamour and entertainment. The only thing that makes him run is the blood of Christ and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to understand the arrow is beyond us. And I want to read this uh, starting at verse 35. And so it was in the morning that Jonathan went out to the end of the field at the time appointed with David. 
And the little lad was with him, and he said to him, his lad, Now run, find the arrows which I shoot. As the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the lad came to the place where the arrow was, Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried out after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond you? I had a happy life. I was winning drug addicts. I was leading people to the Lord. God was blessing our ministry when one day God said, I want you to begin to write a blog where I will show you how to expose the political evil in the United States. This is when nobody was doing it. I went to my best friend. He said, don't do it. He said, don't do it. So I told him, you know what? I'm going to write a couple blogs, see how it goes. Twelve people read my first blog. The devil said, you're crazy. I went after an individual that everyone loved. Everyone thought he was great. Everyone thought he was God's answer to America and racism and everything else. But I began to show the dark side. I began to talk about the agenda that was going to be unleashed in our schools and in our nation. And it was so weird. Suddenly, I, I was called a politician. And I said, that's funny. When I was in the ghetto preaching against drugs and against heroin and crack cocaine, nobody accused me of being a pharmacist. But now I'm a politician. So a pastor told me, you're nothing but a politician now. I looked at him and I said, let me ask you a question. Why aren't you condemning abortion from your pulpit? Why aren't you standing for marriage between a man and a woman according to the word of God? Why aren't you mad at the teachers? I'm going to talk to you for a second because I wrote this. I said, look, the war is not between you and your child's teacher. The war is between your child and that teacher. When you think I'm going to send my child into the public school so that he can save the public school, it's the teacher against the child. You've got to understand that. You've got to think of your child first. Mari, you're talking like a politician. And I looked at him and I said, why aren't you speaking against abortion and gay marriage? Well, he said I would lose members. I said, you mean votes. I said, I'm not the politician, you are. Somebody give me an amen. It, listen, I'm telling you, San Diego VO, the arrow is beyond you. God wants a church in this city that's going to tell the devil, literally, get up, pack up, get out. So I kept on writing. I kept on praying. Today, that blog has been read by over 20 million people. And it changed. It changed the face. We do tent crusades where thousands come. We're going to do one in the Los Angeles fairgrounds in September. I want all of you to come. You know, we did. We just bought a 5,000 seat tent. 5,000 seats. I'm moving on. The arrow is beyond you is best to be understood by an experiment that scientists have done with fish. They would put a large tank, and in the tank, they put a certain kind of fish and then a glass sheet so that the other side of the tank had the fish that this fish ate. Predator and prey. So for a long, long time, these fish would bang against the sheet of glass until they finally gave up. They were frustrated so long that they stayed over here. 
So the scientists removed the glass sheet where these fish are free to go over. None of them would go over there. They were believing in a false limit. The current church believes that America doesn't want Jesus. The modern church believes they don't want to hear the Bible. The, the modern church is bumping its head against that glass sheet saying, after 12 minutes, they got to be out of here. If you say anything about sin, they're not going to stay there. And, and they won't even try to find out. You know, Mary was told to go to the tomb, but she didn't know that the stone was already rolled away. And the arrow's beyond you. San Diego, you can't look at the LGBTQ community and their agenda and say we can't preach Christ or we can't tell them to repent. You can't buy into that garbage because God has removed that glass sheet. Glory to God. I want to introduce you to a phrase that I want you to use from now on. I don't know. I think it might be a t-shirt. You got to be brave when you mention a victory outreach that you can do a new t-shirt. They will get it done. Everyone's talking about the end of the world, the end of the world, the end of the world. And we bought into this scenario. Global warming is going to destroy the earth. Listen, if Al Gore really believed that hot air would destroy the earth, he would shut up. Man, I worked on that this morning. Just tell your neighbor who Al Gore is. I know that was the problem. How will the world end? In every eschatology of Christianity that's popular today, we are convinced that evil must expand. There's nothing we can do about it. Tread water, hang on, stay saved. Don't advance, don't invade, don't come up with ideas, and don't build anything. That has never been the tradition of the Christian faith. Until now. So how will the world end? People say the end of the world will come when the Antichrist appears. Wrong. The world will end when the money runs out, the oil runs out, life runs out, decency runs out. One day, Jesus took his disciples to Jerusalem. And a lot of people don't realize how advanced the architecture was under Herod in the city of Jerusalem. You realize the Pharisees were milking the people for their money, especially widows, and they lived in palaces themselves. The Pharisees did. Some of them had indoor plumbing. 2,000 years ago, we can't even get a plumber today. I'm working up here. And the Bible tells us that they were staring at all the buildings. And Peter couldn't help. He was overcome. He tried to impress Jesus with the architecture of Jerusalem. And it was, as far as man was concerned, it was amazing. But it wasn't when you think of where Jesus came from, the right hand of God. The Bible tells us that they asked Jesus, look at these buildings. And then Jesus said something none of them could have imagined. He said, you see all these buildings? Not one of them will be left standing. And in fact, they will be torn down so completely that not one brick will be on top of another. Now stop right there and look at me. You know, they were only 30 five years away from the fulfillment of that verse. And the Bible is very interesting. This is the capital of the Jewish empire. So imagine you and I walking with Jesus on the Capitol Mall, 
we look to our right, there's the Washington Monument. There's the towering Hall of Congress, the Smithsonian, the Lincoln Memorial, the Congressional Library, the National Archives. And somebody stands there. You see all these buildings in Washington, D.C.? Not one brick will be left on top of another. And if you heard Jesus say that, you, you would begin to quake. Same man that raised Lazarus. Same man that calmed the sea. Same man that multiplied the fish and the bread. Has just told you that every brick in the American empire would be torn down. That cannot happen. You could not destroy Herod's architecture without first conquering the Jewish nation completely. And so it was that Titus, they came in from the north. The Romans invaded from the north. And you wonder, how did they get through Naphtali? It wasn't called that at the time. The northern tribes, how did they get through? Because they were the ten tribes that had cut off from Judah and Benjamin. Now listen to me. How many of you getting anything from what I'm preaching today? Now, the next thing that happened. How did they get through? Because the hedge of God had been removed. You see, the Gadarenes was in the north. And the Bible says that Jesus went to the Gadarene, cast the devil out of a man. And the man said, the demon said, would you let us get in the pigs? None of you have thought about it. What were Jewish farmers doing raising pigs? They'd lost their culture. They'd lost their morals. And now the hedge is down and the Romans came. And Titus came in with a huge army. And you know what happened? The Israelis, and here's what Jesus said. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, run to the hills. That's why the Christians were spared. Instead, a spirit got on the inhabitants of Jerusalem to rail against the Romans. And they had strict orders from Caesar not to destroy the city, to take it with as little blood as possible. But instead, the, re the rioting and the rage of the people in the city against the Romans drove them into a massive military road rage till they destroyed the city and every brick was down. Why am I telling you all this? Because they were terrified when Jesus said, it'll be done. They think that almost a million Jews were killed in that raid for Rome. 70 AD. As the left loves to say, Google it. <laughs> now, for your wife's sake, for your children's sake, for your future's sake, listen to what I'm going to tell you. How you act hangs on one thing. How do you believe the world will end? And so the disciples said, when will these things be? They should have been asking, what are we supposed to do? So he didn't answer the question they asked. He answered the question they should have asked. They said, give us a date. He said, take heed that you're not deceived. And the church is being fooled in America right now. We are being fooled. And I'm going to tell you how we're being fooled. It's because it says in verse 14, it won't be fire, it won't be earthquakes, it won't be nation rising against nation. All those things are going to happen, but that won't end the world. It won't end the world when everything in the Middle East is fulfilled. It won't, it's not Gog and Magog. I believe in all that. But Jesus said, let's be clear. The world will not end until the gospel is preached to the whole world. Now, I got to flip the script. 
The arrow is beyond depression. The arrow is beyond fear. The arrow is beyond limits. The arrow is not about sickness or poverty or closed doors or angry leftists. The arrow is beyond that. The gospel is going to get to the whole world, folks. God's going to heal the sick. He's going to empty wheelchairs. He's going to make cancer vanish and blind eyes open. He's looking for a church that says we are on the earth to preach that gospel that it will be so powerful that we will envelop the earth and then Jesus will come. I'm, I'm about to run out of here and just go around the block screaming. You may be seated. Thank you. I appreciated that. So I have a new phrase. Stop fearing. Stop believing in limits. Stop believing that you can't get the degree. You can't buy the house. You can't start the business. You can't plant and do it. The world's not going to end until a signs and wonders gospel envelops all the nation. And the Bible says, and the glory of the Lord will rise and all nations shall see it together. Here's the t-shirt. Here's the phrase. Quit fearing. Quit being depressed. Quit feeling limited. Do you understand that the object of any general, the first rule of any military general is to take his troops out of certain annihilation. Retreat. If we couldn't change San Diego, God would have taken us out. If we couldn't make that dream come true, God would have taken us out. We're not here to be depressed. We're not stuck on American Airlines on the tarmac with a two-hour delay. We're not here to be oppressed. We're not here to be worried. We're here because we can still win in Jesus' name. Here's the t-shirt. The end times are not happening to me. I am happening to the end times. The devil's not the problem. I'm the secret weapon. Some, are you feeling this yet? If anybody aligns themselves with the truth and says what the word of God says, he continually leads us to victory. We're not leaving. Quietly. The arrow is beyond shortages. You know, a lot of you don't realize that Christians sometimes are against technology. And they don't know history. Because you see, there was a time where the greatest art in the world was produced to the glory of Christ. Handel's Messiah. The statues of Michelangelo. Europe was filled that when a piece of music was written the best of the best was always Christian now we got a bunch of people that sound like a bee in a coke bottle calling it worship music you know what somebody help me right now I was landing in Nashville and the guy next to me I was talking to him and I said, he said, what do you do? I said, I'm a preacher. And I asked him, well, what do you do? He said, I write worship choruses. 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 <laughs> Handel, Bach, all of them. The best paintings, the best art devoted to Christ. Then we had a brain lapse where art became evil and creativity became unchristian. 
And then we say, well, how come Michael Dell leaves college, starts Dell Computers? And an aging hippie in Albuquerque, Bill Gates, develops Microsoft. And Stephen Jobs, who half the time didn't know his name because of marijuana. <laughs> Meanwhile, the church says, that's of the devil. We can't be in that. I remember listening to church saying, you can't have drums in the house of God. I said, brother, there was a time where most of the drums were in the house of God. You go back 300 years, you'll understand. American Christians don't get it. We're supposed to be the leading edge in culture. We're supposed to be. Where do you think? You know, do you know how many people have been given God-given ideas through the centuries? I know a hundred of them. Let's begin with one. During the First World War, the greatest problem that the armies of freedom against fascism had was the dynamite in the horse-drawn carrot carts was blowing up. So we couldn't move dynamite to the front line because it would always blow up. So a man was reading the Bible one day. Reading the Bible. Hey, let's go back. Read the Bible. And he's reading the Bible one day and he comes to the book of Job where it says, you have trapped fire in ice. You have held the fire back by the ice. And the man said, we're supposed to pack the TNT in ice. A direct invention from the Bible. Christians virtually invented the hospital. They invented the best programs to feed the poor the world has ever known. They've done more. All 10 Ivy League schools were born in revival. Princeton, Harvard, all of them, born in Christian revival. And you know why they became the way they are today? Because the church stopped funding them. So they reached out to secular money because the church didn't see any value in higher education. Now I'm going to tell you, it's about time that we realize that that glass sheet is not there, that the world is open, the art world is open, Hollywood is open, education is open. I'm going to say it again, see if I can get some response. The end times are not happening to me. I am happening to the end times. 